This is Tony Broom welcoming you to the podcast today featuring a message from New Bethel Baptist Church entitled, If Jesus Were Here Today, Matthew chapter 4, verses 17 through 25. Last time we came, we brought a skunk with us. <laughs> I'm glad my sermon didn't turn out that way. Uh-huh, it's the worst I ever heard. <laughs> well, praise the Lord. I'm glad that we have a sweet smell about us this morning. Hopefully, I mean, I took my bath, my weekly bath, whether I need to or not. I think I'm all right, and, you know. But uh, I'm glad that we're here. The sweet smell I'm talking about is the sweet smell of the Lord. His presence is with us today. And I'd like to draw your attention to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 4. The reading from Matthew chapter 4, verses 17 through 25. Reading at verse 17 to the end of the chapter. Our subject today is, if Jesus were here. You can fill in the blanks. If Jesus were here today, what would He do? What would He say? How would He act? The Lord Almighty bless His Word we consider for a few moments together. Thank you for allowing us to come and be part of this service today. And our hearts will be blessed by God's Word as always is. He has promised to anoint His Word. And He always does. Thank Him for that. Praise God for that. And His Word today will tell us, if Jesus were here, what He would do and how He would act. Of course, the object is to be edified and built up from the Word of God, and hopefully we will start acting. We're not already. We'll start acting like Jesus act, acts, acted, and we will continue to do it if we're already doing it. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter, and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. And going on from thence, he saw other two brethren, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in a ship with Zebedee their father, mending their nets. And he called them. They immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. And his fame went throughout all Syria. And they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with divers diseases and torments and those which were possessed with devils and those which were lunatic, and those that had the palsy, and he healed them. And there followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee, and from Decapolis, and from Jerusalem, and from Judea, and from beyond Jordan. You'll notice as I begin to read that scripture, and I've tried in my later years of preaching to do what you don't do in the beginning, and that is when you read the scripture, slow down. Because it's God's Word that's important anyway. It's a whole lot more important than what I've got to say. Hopefully what I've got to say is a, a rhema version of the Logos written Word that's already here for us. And the rhema Word is just to, to build and bank on that and to edify us and lift us up today, but to slow down and read the Scripture. But you'll notice as I read that, I kept what we call in the musical term as a crescendo. You start kind of easy, just like you get through eating a big old bowl of butter beans. And you're real comfortable and you're ready to lay down and take a nap. But when you go to the table to get that chicken leg, you kind of jump it up and down a little bit. Well, that's the way it is when you start off reading the Scripture. You start off reading about what Jesus did and by the time you get to the end of it, you are in a climax and you're in that, that high place of Jesus gives excitement in His Word as to what he did. Everything that He did, everything that He said is exciting. 
Every word that he spoke, hallelujah, is worth, worthy of praise and glory. He is God Almighty. Our Sunday school lesson. I hope you don't mind give reference to the Sunday school lesson. It happens to be in the Pentecostal church, but yours may be too, as far as I know. But it's talking about the supremacy of Jesus Christ. He is supreme. He is Lord over all. And Hebrews chapter 1 tells us about that, that He is God Almighty. He's Lord over creation. He has a title of this universe. And that's the one that we're talking about today. What if Jesus were here today? And take away the word what. Just say, if Jesus were here today. Well, if Jesus were here today, He would challenge people to repent. Now that's the first thing we read about. Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It says that he began to preach and to say, repent. It didn't say that Jesus in only one time in his ministry said, repent. It didn't say for one time only he said and preached, repent. It didn't say this is just a one-time word. It gives us the principle, it gives us the implication that this is a part of the message of Christ, is to repent. Some people say, well... Repent of what? They don't think they've done anything. But you look around at the condition of our world today, and they've done, may I say, we have done things. We have done. Anything in this world is bad and wrong. It's our fault. It's not God's fault. And if we don't want to take the blame on it, maybe we can blame it on the devil, booger man, old slewfoot. Maybe it's his fault. But you and I have to have human responsibility of our part of the ill that's going on in our society today. And not just in our society, but in the church world. God is saying to the lost, ranked, heathen sinner out there in the world, He said, repent and get right with God. And that's what repent means. I mean, they have all these scholarly definitions. You know, you change your mind or, or you, you relent and you repent and you, you do an uh, about face, you turn around and all that. But really, what it means to us to repent means to, to change, let God change you. It means to get right with God. That's what repenting is. I'm not talking about reformation. I'm not talking about just turning over a new leaf. You know, turning over a new leaf is nothing more than what I did in this paper while ago. Just, just turn over a new paper. That doesn't do anything. You know, paper, one way I turn it over, it's paper. The other way I turn it over, it's still paper. I mean, it's acne paper. It's got bumps on it, you know, but I need that to read with. But it's still paper. It doesn't do anything. Just turning over something doesn't do anything. Turning over a new leaf, going to three step, six step, twelve step, it doesn't do anything. And thank God for all that. I mean, if he's going to be a sinner anyway, I'd rather for him to be a sober sinner than a drunk sinner. You know, thank God for it all. I mean, but but the Lord, that's not repentance. Repent means to change. It means to, to let God change your heart and your life. People need to repent. You know, Malachi, I smile because I remember the first time I came here, I preached from the book of Malachi. And one thing in the book of the Malachi book of Malachi said, uh, you know, in the book of Malachi, the people said, hey, return to the Lord. God said, return to the Lord. And they said, return? We had not gone anywhere. They don't think they've, they've, to use a double negative, which is not good English, they don't think they've done nothing. They don't think they've gone anywhere. God said, yes, you have. You've gone a, a long mile, a long, many miles, country mile away from God. Jesus says, repent. Why? Shall we repent? Because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus will bring His kingdom over this world and establish righteousness and holiness, and He will set down His kingdom, set up His kingdom, whichever way you want to look at it is, is correct. He will make everything that's wrong right. Everything that's broken, He'll fix it. And what He doesn't fix and make right, He'll just do away with it altogether. Everything will be right. There's a kingdom that's coming. You and I, we don't know the day, we don't know the hour. And if Jesus were on earth, when He was on earth, and He said, repent. If the message of repentance was urgent when He was on earth, just think how more urgent that it is now. In this late hour, if Jesus were on earth, when He was on earth, if that represented the last days, just think how late it's getting now. I mean, that mouse is fixing to jump up on the top of that clock at 12 o'clock. It's later than many people think. It's time that people get right with God. 
It's time that people in the world come and, and let Jesus save them and get right with God. It's time that people in the church get right with God. Quit playing games. Quit being bound by alcohol. Quit being bound by tobacco. Quit being bound by the evil ills of our society. Quit being bound by sin. God wants us to get right with God. He wants us to live a holy life. And He wants us to know that He's here today to help us. If Jesus were here today, He would do the same thing that He did walking the shores of Galilee. He would challenge people to repent. The next thing He would do, He would call people to follow and serve Him. He preached and He gave a message of repentance. And He also gave an invitation for people to come and to follow Him. He saw Simon, Peter, and Andrew, his brother. They were fishing. They were, you know, doing what fishermen do. Just trying to catch a few fish. Trying to get yourself a few little pork and beans to eat at night. You know, they were minding their own business. They were just fishing. wasn't bothering anybody. You know, if people in our society, if they ain't going to work, at least they ought to go fishing. You know why? Because if you go fishing, you're not in trouble bothering nobody else in business. Robbing and stealing and doing all that. At least let them go fishing. If they ain't going to go to work, let them go fishing. At least they'll stay out of trouble. These guys were just fishing. They're minding their own business. And lo and behold, here comes Jesus. He says, follow me. And I will make you fishers of men. I will cause you. I will change your life. That's what he's saying. I will give you something in your heart and in your life that will cause you to catch men. That will cause you to be a fisher of men. You know, many people think that Jesus just said, follow me, and that's it. Just follow me. And sometimes the Bible does say that. It just says, follow me. But actually, what Jesus is doing it then is the same thing He's doing now. He never asked anybody to follow Him without giving them a promise. Jesus didn't say, just follow me for nothing. He says, follow me and I'll save you. Follow me and I will help you. Follow me and I will heal you. Follow me and I will give you eternal life. What's a greater gift than that? There is none. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And he goes on down and he saw, after, of course, they immediately they left their nets and they followed him. And he goes on a little further and he sees James and John. You remember that, Andrew, maybe not so much him, but Peter, James, and John was in that, that close circle. That place they got to see a, a lot of the special miracles that Jesus did. And they, they were with him when he raised the dead. And they were with him when in his last hour of temptation and trial. And, and they were with him there when some of the others were not. And he called them to him. And he says, follow me. And they were in the ship with Zebedee, their father. They were mending their nets. There was some work there that needed to be done. I mean, Zebedee needed his boys. They, he couldn't do the work alone. But Jesus comes and he calls him and says, follow me. And it says, immediately they left their, the, the ship, they left their father in the ship, and they followed him. Does that say that Jesus is not concerned about Zebedee's living and about the, the work that's going on? What's happening? Does it? How does he feel about that? Well, certainly it's important. He needed to have the nets repaired. He needed to have fish. He needed to have a living. Jesus cares about everything in our life. But there are some things that are more important than others, and that is the kingdom of God, the spreading of the gospel, living for God, serving God, is the most important thing that we'll ever do. And yes, it's true. We've got to go to Bojangles and get that biscuit on sale. We've got to go to Walmart and get that 10% off on Wednesday and Roses and get that senior discount. And that's important because it helps us out a little bit. But you know, there's something more important than that. It's the preaching of the gospel of Christ. It's living for Jesus. That's the most important thing. And that's why He did that. That's what He wants us to know here is because He still, if Jesus were here today, He would call people to follow and serve Him. And He still does. Sometimes we think nobody's getting saved anymore. Nobody's getting blessed anymore. Nobody's getting called into the ministry anymore. But He will, and He does. He saves, and He still calls, and He still blesses, and He still does the things that He did when He walked the shores of Galilee. The third thing He would do, He would calm people by offering them forgiveness and hope. 
That's what Jesus came to do. They followed Him. And they left their circumstances the way they were and they put their hand in the hand of the man from Galilee. And that's what He does today. He offers people hope. There's little hope in our society that we live in. There's little hope in the government. There's little hope in the political parties. One spills a bucket of lies and the other comes on another night or two later and spills another bucket of lies. Of course, you know when they're talking, right? When their lips are moving, you know they're lying. But you don't have to lie. It's natural for us to lie, but when God gets a hold of your heart, He don't want you to lie anymore. He wants you to speak the truth. And we need people who will speak the truth. We need people in the government who will speak truth. We need people in the pulpit who will preach and speak truth. We need people in the church, the Sunday school class. We need people everywhere who will stand up for what's right and speak the truth. Just speak the truth. Your parents always told you. One thing they all, they told you, if you speak the truth, I won't give you a whipping. Isn't that a wonderful reason to tell the truth? Sometimes we wouldn't tell the truth and he'd beat the daylights out of you anyway. It's just so much better to tell the truth. It's so hard for us to do that. But when Jesus gets a hold of our heart, He calms people by offering them forgiveness and hope. When He forgives your sins, and everybody in here that knows Christ today is a witness of that, you know that your sins are forgiven. It's not just because you joined the church. It's not just because you've been dunked in a lake of water in a baptismal pool. It's not just because you shook the preacher's hand or signed a card. That's not what forgives your sins. You know that your sins are forgiven because you have placed your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ. And if you don't know that today, you need to come back for another dip. Make sure that you have made your calling and election sure. And make sure that your sins are forgiven. And when your sins are forgiven, you know you have hope. You have hope as never before. When the world is falling apart all around you, you know that you still have joy, you still have hope, because He has put hope in your heart and your life. If Jesus were here today, He would, number four, He would cure people of all their elements in body, mind, and spirit. Now, I don't care what church and I know we. this is New Bethel Church. And this is your church. But I don't care what church you go to. I don't care what name it is. Some people teach and preach divine healing more than others. I realize that. But all of us know and believe that Jesus can heal. I mean, don't, we, don't you believe Jesus can heal this morning? Don't you know that Jesus can heal? Yes. Sure He does. He can. God is our healer. And what, he, what would He do if He were here with us today? Do you think He would let us go out of here blind like I am and crippled like some of you are and maimed and I don't think so if Jesus were here today he would do the same thing that he did when he came to earth he would do the same thing that we read about Jesus went about all Galilee teaching in their synagogues preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people and that's what he did he preached and he it's not good English either but it's a good message he he preached and he teached he taught and He healed. And that's what the gospel message is all about today. Teaching and preaching. I don't care how old a church is. You can't get away from the preaching of the Word of God. You can't get away from teaching the Word of God. And you can't get away from Jesus. He's still our healer. He's the one who blesses us. He's the one who makes us whole. If He were here today, He would do the same thing. He would cure people of all their ailments in body Mind and spirit. Said they brought to him all the sick people, those which were possessed with devils, those which were lunatic, those that had the palsy, and he healed them. He healed many of divers' diseases. You know, I've heard preachers make a joke about that. People have divers' diseases now, and they don't realize it. They dive out of the door after Sunday school, they dive out to the shopping mall, they dive out, and they got divers' diseases, all right. They dive out. Any way they can get in and get away from the Lord. But you know, the right kind of people don't do that. The, the, the ones who are bought by the blood, the ones who are born again, the ones who had their sins forgiven and who have their sins forgiven, 
Oh, they're rejoicing in their salvation. Jesus heals in body. That's what we're most familiar with, and that's what we can see when somebody says that they've got a good report, somebody says they've been healed. And that's the, that's the one we see, but there's more healing than in the body. There's healing of the mind. Acts 10.38 says, How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. He heals your mind. He heals your spirit. He gives you hope in your spirit. He, he touches your spirit so that you can worship Him, so that you can praise Him, so that you can give Him all glory. If Jesus were here today, He would continue reaching people as long as it were possible until every individual had made their choice as to whether or not to follow Him. As long as it, it would be possible as long as he could, he would extend the gospel invitation. And that's what he did then. That's what he still does today. He extends that choice. He extends that offer as long as it is possible until every individual has made their choice. Some choose to serve him. Some choose not to serve him. But that's a choice that we all need to make. And we all must make. Every individual make their choice as to whether or not to follow Him. The offer, the invitation is the same now as it was then. As He spoke to the disciples, what did He say? Two words, follow me. And He speaks to us today. Many of us He's spoken to for years. Do you realize, some of you remember, how, many, how, how much time it took for Him to really get a hold of your life. He spoke to you and He convicted you of your sin and He dealt with you for years. Many people have been dealt with for years. Thank God for the mercy of God that He didn't give up on me, that He didn't throw away the clay. But He kept on dealing with me and He kept on working with me. I wish I'd have been like the disciples. He said, follow me. And I said, okay, Lord. Sometimes you don't do that. Sometimes He said, follow me. And we like that other man in the Bible said, well, I've got to do this and that and the other first. Thank God that He cares about us. Thank God that He works with us. If Jesus were here today, He would do all of what I just talked about. But you know what the Bible says? 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17. Now the Lord is that Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. That's telling me that Jesus is not here today in a body walking around like we are. But it's telling me that Jesus is here today because He's here through the power of the Holy Ghost, through His Holy Spirit. Now the Lord is that Spirit. It is saying when the Spirit of God is allowed to move in the hearts and lives of people, that He has the same power, authority, and attributes that Jesus had when He were here in the flesh walking the shores of Galilee. The Spirit of God is the one who is operating in the church today through the power of God. He's operating through the body of Christ and He's ministering His power to and through believers. And that's way, that way that Jesus is operating in the church today. If it were not, it would be pitiful because He said, I'm going away, but I'm going to leave you a comforter who will abide with you forever. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, some newer Bible versions say it like this, the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Many churches don't have freedom today to worship God. They're unfamiliar, they're scared, they're afraid of getting out of control. Well, whose control are we in? Are we in the control of the, the uh, administration? Are we in the control of a preacher or a man? Are we in control of Jesus Christ? We in control of the Holy Spirit. We under the power. If we are under the power and control of the Holy Spirit, we don't have to worry about doing anything that would be abnormal, doing anything that would be wrong, because He's in control. And when Jesus is here through His Spirit, He can do the same thing that He did. He will continue to preach. He may use some knothead like me to do it, but He'll continue to preach. Repent. Get right with God. He'll continue to call people to follow and serve Him. He will continue to offer people forgiveness and hope. He will continue to touch people and heal in mind, body, and spirit. And He will continue 
to offer, continue offering that invitation as long as it's necessary, as long as it's possible, till every soul is heard, till everyone has the opportunity to come and know this wonderful Lord. Heavenly Father, thank You for Your Word. Thank You for the power of Your Word. We recorded way back in Matthew 4. But Lord, it speaks to us today and helps us to know that the same God that walked the shores of Galilee, the lowly Galilean, Jesus, the Son of God, God the Son, is here today through the power of the Holy Ghost, through His blessing, through His Spirit. He's here to touch us. He's here to help us. He's here to lift us up. And I pray that you do that for your people this day. In Jesus' name, amen. You have been listening to a podcast today featuring a message from New Bethel Baptist Church entitled, If Jesus Were Here Today. This is presented by Tony Broom Ministries. Join us next time for the next podcast.